You see, as we all know and have heard in this class a thousand times, it's not just good enough to copy nature. It's, nature has to be transformed in some way. And it's not good to copy, just copy other painters' paintings either. Because that's somebody else's creativity at work. Their vision, their use of composition, their color tones, their palette, their shapes of trees. Nature has to be filtered through the artist. And the artist has to spend time immersed in the subject matter that they love. And if they love all subject matter, that's fine too. But what, they, what one should do as a fine artist is to examine all the other painters that have gone before, especially the ones that have focused on the particular area that one responds to your, yourself. I responded to the tonalist painters. So I dug up all the information I could on all the tonalist painters for all the past centuries and whittled it down, slowly but surely, copied a lot of them. They're all deceased. They all had a lot of knowledge. There's very little written about their techniques. There's a lot written about their lives, but not a lot written about their techniques. So I myself had to dig, copy, try to read, try to look again, study, study, study for a good 12 years trying to find how they developed paintings from the ground up. Once I discovered a lot of their techniques, I mishmashed a lot of things together. Some of the artists that I admired put together with some of my own uh, ideas about what, what I think fine art should be, uh, different subject matters put together, my palette kind of got kind of muddy, dark. Hopefully I'm bringing up the color a little bit more. You can always tell by my sails. Too dark, too muddy, no sails. Beautiful grays, beautiful tonality, beautiful color harmonies, chromas, sails go up. So there's a little synopsis about what I think one should do as an artist, as a painter. Whittle it down, get two or three artists that you just absolutely get knocked out about their paintings. Or if you're a sculptor, um, their sculptures. Or if you're a photographer, the photographs. Whittle it down, work from them, emulate them for a while, but all the other time, find out what makes you tick as an artist. Why, what do you want to express? What do you want your paintings to look like? How, how do you uniquely transform your vision of nature to raise it to a, a profound level on a white canvas? There's, a, there's, a, there's an infinite number of ways you can do it. As, as many people as there are on the planet at any given century, there's as many ways as you uniquely can paint a painting. Don't buy into that whole idea that everything's already been done before. Because every time you think that, you go on the internet and you find an artist and you go, oh my gosh, wow, look what that person came up with. What a unique way of painting. What a unique way of looking at nature. What a unique, I mean, we're, it's as unique as every single person. So you got to go within to find out what makes you tick and what your likes and dislikes, your colors, your, how, how you feel plays a big part in how to make great art. F feelings, in my opinion. It's not just about representational nature. Like I always say, we already, we have the pot. We have the bucket. I don't want to see the bucket on the canvas. I want to see your version of the bucket on the canvas. We have the sheep. 
I used to have a dozen sheep. I had the sheep. I don't want to see more sheep. I want to see art. What are you going to do? How are you going to make your version of the sheep? Even the portraits. Even if they look exactly like the person. Even though we got the person, we want the person on the canvas to have some more art about it. So if you study like the sergeants and the greats, the Rembrandts, the Rubens, the Halls, today Richard Schmidt and many other great portrait artists. I was just looking up a few online the other day and it's, I find there's all these other great living painters. And to see what they're doing. You know, study, study, study. You can never study too much. I was in art school. I didn't learn a thing. But when I left art school, I began a crusade to better myself as an artist. And I was self-taught. I studied as much as I could, whenever I could. I went anywhere I had to go to find the kind of work that re I responded to. Museums, galleries, private collections. I started copying those paintings. I started reading about those artists. And I just lost my train of thought. I don't know where I was going with that one. Well, I better get busy. I have to film today. Uh, incidentally, for all you viewers at home, I'm doing a 28-minute demonstration for a local Bedford Cable television station. It probably also will be aired on YouTube. It is a bonus demo. So everybody who gets the studio version here is subscribers. But you also will get free of no charge thrown in at my expense <laughs> a 28 minute demo at no cost. It's my way of advertising my academy. Because at the end of the demo, it says go to sheanacademy.com. So I can try to drum up some more students. We just had people sign up from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, the old Bosnia, I don't even know what you call that country anymore. Yugoslavia, Herzegovina. I don't know. Um, who else? New Zealand, Australia, and one other country, I forget. But. So we, we, we're expanding across the globe. We've got to break into the Asia, you know. We gotta, there was someone from Bangkok. I don't know what happened to that person. We have Ireland, we have Canada, we have Hawaii, uh, all over the America. So it's pretty interesting. And I hope people are getting something out of these instructions. I wish I could be a little more, uh, see, I forget things. I've been doing this for 20 years. So I, I assume people have heard a lot of these things that I talk about before, but maybe you haven't. So you kind of have to bear with it and kind of take bits and pieces that apply to you individually along your little path of fine art. So without further rambling, feel like doing something funky. And I would, I would actually recommend a start similar to what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to, oops. <laughs> oops. And last week, all you saw of me was this <laughs> in the campus. Because I had it zoomed in, sorry. This week you got the whole scenario. I'm mixing up turp, brown, green, blue, red. I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff. Look, red, blue, turp. I want to get something juicy. I want it to be kind of dark, like look, same color as the palette. Pretty good, huh? Can't even see the paint, can you? Need more juice. I want this to be, I just want to, I don't know what I want to do. That's too brown. I don't like that. 
I'm going to change the tone. Maybe a little more violet. So I'll put some blues. A little red. A little more turp. I hardly ever, 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 hardly ever use turp at this stage. Hardly ever. See the difference to blue, purple? I don't like the bright brown. Brown was too bright. Kill it a little with the blue, the violet. Where, oh, where did my painting go? Where, oh, where can it be? Where's my painting? You know, if I wasn't a landscape painter, I'd be another Franz Klein. What's the matter? They're all cracked up here. See, if you're going to do that, we all know that you have to repeat shapes. So you've got to do that, see? You have to always repeat directions. But now you've got too much of that. So what you've got to do is this. So you offset that by doing this. See? Rhythm. You didn't know you had to have rhythm to be a painter, huh? You really do have to have rhythm. There's like five things. There's harmony. I got it on the sheets. I hand out sheets. Harmony. Balance. Unity. Repetition. And... I forget the last one. It's, it's, we'll, we'll get to it. It's harmony, balance, unity, rhythm. Um. Oh, you were? Oh, you all ought to know. I can still get the Franz Klein feeling before I start to put in anything that resembles nature. Oh, great. Next thing I need you to work on, Dave, is a paper towel rack here. Get that, get that, that, that crack uh, maintenance guy on it. Well, see, now that I've cleaned my palette from that, I use this and kind of just want to get rid of some of the white. I don't want to lose all my drips and smudges and shapes necessarily. I don't know what I'm going to use, what I'm not going to use. I'm going to go back into that. I'm going to beef up the paint a little thicker. I'm going to go right to the knife. I just feel like doing something a little off the charts, so to speak. Now, I happen to like a very neutral gray Put a little black in it, but I can put red too. I like a, a neutral, earthy, olivey green. I just happen to like that color. So, if I put it on here in small doses, mix it up again, change it. It doesn't stick too well, but that's okay. This is all going to start drying. I'm going to brighten it up a little even. More yellow, more blue. So this is going to be a brighter version of the green. I just want to get paint on top of this. Now I can take the knife and if I want to clean something up, or take off paint somewhere. Here. If I want to do this, I can take off paint or I can go back over. I 
like I said, I got to do something off the charts. That doesn't mean good. It just means it's off the charts. I'm going to get that blue going with the brown, which is another way of making a dark, like a black. Dip it into the pale oil. Mix up. Now we have a kind of a really dark version of green here. Can everybody see that? It's kind of a blue-green, so it's a cool. This is a very cool green. Actually, speaking of cool, Ron was supposed to come by today. Don't know if he will. What do you think? You think this is how Do Big Nay painted? Yeah, just, just a thought. Maybe a lot of them painted like this. I don't know. This is different, I must say. Nothing wrong with being different. I'm going to put some more dark in the foreground, that same mixture, right in here. Not sure why. Oh, what am I doing? Time out. Be right back. Stop. Three. We're back. I like to paint in the frame. It helps me keep the parameters of the composition, helps me eye it closer, and it just really makes the, the whole process easier and excite, more exciting, I would have to say. So we have some kind of dark here. We have the tree, the darks. We got probably going to put something light in the middle there. So with the paper towel, I'm going to play around with some bright, brighter, not bright test. A little more yellowy. That could be a tree. See that drip? I think that will be a tree. I'm going to switch off and go back to the knife. I'm going to get that yellow going. Too much green in my yellow. Get rid of the green. And I'm going to put that there. Now I can go into the orange area. Must be a tree over there. It's by happenstance. Show you how we develop that tree. Quite proficiently. Right here. Little tree. So, even at this stage, I noticed that it's a tree, so I'm going to leave it there. And it doesn't really matter that it's early on in the painting process. Oops. And the distant landscape, I'm going to take a yellow yellow into a green, and a little, into that reddish mix. And I'm going to play into the distant tree patterns. I'm making it up as I go, see? There's all kinds of stuff happening out here. Play into the drips. It's crucial to let your, um, let your eye 
Let your eye see things that are random patterns in the messy mix that I started with. Don't have preconceived, oh, I got to do this, or I got I to gotta put this, I got to, it doesn't come, it comes from here now. Once you kickstart this process, it leads the way, believe it or not. Now, I can do things to kind of catapult a few things, to spark a few things. I can't do this both. Driving me nuts. OK. You can do a few things, like if this is kind of bland up here, you know, you can get some more turp, and you can create a few more passages that you want to develop. Whoop. You don't want to make a polluted sky with green in it. We start to see little bits and pieces come together. Now, even the way that I put that tree there, you can also put this tree here. Like this, you're going to get a little bit of a dark. Red and green. I'm not sure if that should be branches. Yeah, maybe. So that drip, I'm just going to go over that drip. Try to make it some kind of tree. even can come out here. Now the branching comes up in here, I see. These are random drips, by the way. Also, I see out here, there's going to be a little sunlit field of gray out here. But it's a gray, a weird kind of gray. It's got orange, green. Well, I'm going to make it more orangey. I guess a sun light is hitting this field way out here. This was all randomly unplanned scenario out there. I see some other drips that are going to lend themselves to be trees. And this, and this, and that. And this tree over here. We're going to go right to the foreground. We're going to lighten this up a little more than I normally do. In here. Textures, grasses, rocks even. Look, you can put a rock right there. Indicator rock. We get a gray. We put a little orange in the gray. Black, white, orange. I don't know. Black, white, orange. When you put a rock, you got to edge it. You 
specimen. Oh. I can also, with a thinner brush, not that brush, I need some new pro strokes. I can edge a few more um, branches that I want to show stronger than some of the others. So I have this reddish, hopefully violet. Where'd this tree go? And then I emphasize any of the darks. Create some textures in the foreground and the grasses. Put a little more violet out near the sky in there. That's purple. I don't like that purple. If you want to kill violet, you put some green in it, which I really do like this particular color here. Kill the white. So I'm going to put this straight through. The gray green. Gray, green, violet. Interesting combination. But quite nice. In here, whoops, in here, in here. I don't know about there. I'm going to fill that in. I'm going to go back to my dark green. Transparent red oxide, day low. <coughs> Build up some of these darks here. These are kind of pine tree-ish shapes, kind of. Add a little more color to the top, maybe. with a little bit of orange, especially over here and here. This is going to be another tree, I guess. That just showed up somehow. This area I'm going to dissolve. because I don't know what it is yet. So I just got rid of that. Then I want this half tone of light from the foreground. So I'm going to bring that in with just a little feathering. Whoop. Don't want to ruin what I have there. So bring this across. Kind of an innocent green coming in there. So I'm going to strengthen that, actually, which has got some blue in it. It's got some gray in it. It's my man, Innes. Put it across here. There'll be some water or something. I don't know yet what it's going to do, so I'll just play around, even with a brush. <sighs> Maybe some oranges. Yellow, green, and orange. Yellow, green, and orange. 
some of it's already kind of already there. Same color, and dance it into the foliage of the tree. And this tree comes up. And there's some stuff going on back here, I don't know. Now that I have the face of the sky, I need a transitional tone in here. What do we do for that? We do a pinkish. Pinkish with a little violet. Like that. I even put, put green in there. So transitional tone, right in there. And this is pretty thick. So I'm going to take my other knife. And kind of just soften that a bit as it goes out into the sky, diffused into the landscape. And brought back in to the Try again. Bring it across. I can brighten that pink up a little more with the yellow orange and put another tone right in there. Another kind of transitional. I'm trying to get this glow, if you don't know. I'm trying to get the glow. Eh, it could be hills out there, it could be mountains, could be anything. Let me just knock it down a little bit here. Before we go any further, let's get some water in this picture. Start with a gray for the water. This will reflect all kinds of stuff up here. This is a violety gray that I have on the brush. So with that, the yellow, the orange, into the water, we'll see what we come up with here. Everything started out as drips, random shapes, and I get a low-toned water for now. Fill in some of the raw canvas. Just to keep some balance, I put that in there. I'm going to strengthen it a little bit.
soften all this down. Oops, wrong brush. What's all this up here? Well, let's see how dry it's all dry. Isn't that great? Turp just dries right up. So we can play with some cloud patterns since it's dry. Again, a violet. I'm not going to use the knife. I'm going to use a brush. One and a half. -a. So.